The Cold War, Scourge of the Middle East, Then and Now By Robert Sun, Matt Schilling, and Misha Sip The Cold War, a period of global tension, began after World War II and ended in 1991, was a series of indirect clashes between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the United States of America. Because the countries were unable to politically solve their differences, and debates only showed tension, the countries had to challenge each other in the form of proxy wars, a type of military conflict where two parties wage war and compare strength to surrogate countries or militant groups, such as Afghanistan. The primary reason for these struggles centered on competing ideals of a capitalist democracy and communism from these two countries, as well as a goal to spread each of the countries' influence and gain more political and military allies throughout a conflicting world. The conflict only gained strength when fear broke out among the two countries' ruling elites that the competing ideals would take root and become dominant within a proxy country's political infrastructures and ultimately within the primary country as well. The two leaders of these countries were faced with dilemmas that could end life on Earth. The constant danger of activation of each country's massive nuclear stockpile. The tension decreased between America and the Soviet Union when the USSR was broken up into the Russian Federation and its surrounding countries, but conflicts were still existent on a global scale, affecting chaotic regions such as the Middle East where proxy wars left the regions unstable and violent. Failed Cold War diplomacy between the US and the USSR caused unrest in Afghanistan and developed the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda. Soviet involvement in Afghanistan lasted nine years, with a conflict between the communist government and the anti-communist uprising starting on December 27, 1979. That day, Soviet troops dressed in Afghan uniforms locked down the government buildings to prevent anti-communist Mujahideen rebels from taking over. To counter this imbalance, the Mujahideens gained help from the US, UK, and other anti-communist countries. At the turn of the decade, in Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, the communist government firmly struck their position and was backed by the Soviets, with the president of Afghanistan saying that the USSR is providing his country with help against outside threats. President Carter at the time, however, disagreed with the Soviet public's motives and decided that the Soviet incursions in Afghanistan was an extremely serious threat to peace and a callous violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. He said that the Soviets claimed falsely that they were invited into Afghanistan to help protect that country from some unnamed outside threat, but the president, who had been the leader of Afghanistan before the Soviet invasion, was assassinated, along with several members of his family. After the Soviets gained control of the capital city of Kabul, only several days later was the new puppet leader even brought into Afghanistan by the Soviets. He also warned that a Soviet-occupied Afghanistan is a stepping stone to possible control over much of the world's oil supplies. With these two direct quotes from these important people, it is understood that they did not care about the welfare of Afghanistan or about the consequences. All the US and the USSR cared about was political relations, power, and petroleum. The war of communist versus anti-communist readily raged on in Afghanistan, and the flames of conflict already present with years of war with the British and themselves were being stoked by the Soviet Union and the US supplying troops, weapons to the respective sides to battle each other. The two factions in Afghanistan engaged in a devastating power struggle and paved the way for an unstable infrastructure that led to the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Carter did say that the United Nations wanted all nations in the region to be free and independent, but the results turned out that the independency led to terrorism. Carter believed that the Soviet Union would threaten the security of all nations including the United States, but the danger is brought to the US by itself. Many terrorists actually came from the Mujahideens, which employed similar tactics in driving out the Soviets. Bombings, destructions of civilian properties, schools, non-Muslim churches, and guerrilla attacks. The Taliban was already around at this time, and acted as a political party. The US actually helped them get power, and saw them as a source of stability for Afghanistan's crumbling infrastructure. The Soviets finally retreated in 1989, and the communist government in Afghanistan fell in 1992. The Mujahideen soon prevailed in taking over the Afghanistan capital, Kabul, setting up a new government and president. The newly divided and conflicting nation of Afghanistan now opened the way for insurgents and extremist groups to take over. 
These insurgents are the ones we know today as the terrorists behind the 9-11 attacks, but were also supported by the U.S. during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Furthermore, the insurgents received their weaponry from the Soviets, which, though is dated, continued to function and take lives. The massive shipments of arms, missiles, and transportation from both nations, as well as caches of weaponry left by the rapid withdrawals all created huge stockpiles of weapons. To make matters worse, in 1991, both the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to end any aid in Afghanistan, leaving the people of Afghanistan to fend for themselves. During this time of unrest, the other group, the Taliban, emerged from the ranks of the Mujahideen. They took over the capital in 1996 and enforced strict rules on society, showing the same cruelty that their Mujahideen predecessors did. The U.S. got involved again, about a decade later, because of the inhumanity of the Taliban and their support of terrorist groups like the Al-Qaeda, which directly opposed the West and supported war and violence against the Westerners in the name of the Holy War, Jihad. Though they were being battled, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda continued to spray destruction over the planet with guerrilla warfare techniques and terrorist attacks. It is painful to remember that the two world powers that allowed these villainous organizations to rise up and gain power. There would be no terrorist groups without weaponry, and the clear mistakes of the USSR and the US are now in view, as the whole world watches weapons that once defended democracy, people's right, and stable government used to bring these things down. The US and the USSR's lack of communication led to wars like this being blown out of proportion by world powers asserting themselves in tiny undeveloped nations. While leaders in great verbal battles such as the kitchen debate politely argued over who had better technology and pointed out each other's misunderstandings of the other's political regime, their nations tore apart small countries in order to call more land and people on the map their ally. Very little direct debate over the proxy wars took place, and both countries only offered their political support openly, and military support was done mysteriously. For instance, Americans sent their weapon support through Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern allies, making it impossible for the USSR to confront them on the subject of the conflict, since they officially had nothing to do with it. After the end of the Cold War, both countries withdrew, while the surrogate country, in this case Afghanistan, had to recuperate from an unstable government, growth of hostile militant groups, not to mention the monetary, environmental, and physical damage of a major military conflict.